the Argentine mainland, and they're in a zone of latitude known as the Furious 50s, that is the 50 degree south latitude. And there's very strong winds blowing around the world here, mostly unencumbered by land. With the exception of the Andes Mountains, there's a lot of wind just blowing over the ocean. And so the west side of the Falklands is often battered by big waves. Inland, some people describe the islands as being kind of stark. That's because there's no native trees. So any trees that you see in the Falkland Islands have been deliberately imported and planted and nurtured because they won't just grow if you don't do a lot of care and give them a wind break and things like that. One of the reasons the islands look like they do and support as much marine biology that they do, like albatrosses and petrels and penguins, is their location near the Southern Ocean in that gigantic circumpolar current that you've heard about from Rodrigo and from Norman. And that's that body of water that's flowing around the world and it squeezes between Cape Horn and the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. It's kind of a pinch point or a bottleneck for this global current. And as it comes through there, it comes out the eastern side of that pinch point, it expands out, flares up, and some of it washes north around the Falklands. When I talked about seabirds, I mentioned, I showed you this slide, of a bloom of phytoplankton seen from space surrounding the Falkland Islands. All that discolored ocean you see, that's because there's so much marine algae growing there. And that marine algae or algae is the basis of the ocean's food chain. So if you have a lot of that, you've got a lot of food for herbivores to graze on, like krill. And of course, everything likes to eat krill, so that starts to feed more and more animals above that. This temperature, or this location, also keeps things re relatively cool. It's not a particularly tropical climate. Looking out from space again, you can see the shape of the archipelago. There are two main islands, and I want to draw your attention to the rough shape of this, because in the next slide, we'll be taking an outline of the islands and superimposing it over another map. So look at the shape there and then look at the blue squiggly lines. To give you some sense of scale, if you're familiar with the New England states and the United States, hmm. for those uh, from the UK or Europe, it's about the size of Wales, or a little bit bigger than Belgium. And if we look at the map with a little bit of uh, topographic relief, the green areas are the low line, and those areas with tans and browns are highlands. You wouldn't really call them mountains as such. There's nothing that takes technical gear to climb. It's all walkable. And in fact, many of the taller mountains is drivable by at least Falkland Islanders and their land rovers. They can go places mere mortals cannot drive. The islands do not have permanent snow cap in the winter. They do not have any glaciers on them anymore. But they did up until about 8,000 years ago during the last ice age. And there's evidence of past glaciation in this land form you see here. This is called a cirque, that amphitheater-like shape. You see, that was the headwaters of a glacier in past times. All the white you see in this photo is just snow. There's no ice here. And that'll all melt away by this time of year. The coastline is very intricate, lots of little bays and coves, excellent harbors. And there are a lot of islands, over 760 islands in the Falklands Archipelago. Twelve of those are permanently inhabited, but most are left to the wildlife. And it's wildlife that is pretty well adapted to a cool climate. Summer temperatures and averages here around about 15 degrees is the high and 6 degrees Celsius 
is the low average minimum in Fahrenheit that's 59 to 42 degrees. In the winter, it's cool, but it's not cold. The sea generally does not freeze around the Falklands. Snow falls, but it doesn't last for many days. You can see the, the winter minimum is right above freezing. So just at 0.4 degrees Celsius of 33 Fahrenheit. So it's not a bitterly cold place. And that's not surprising given that it's in the subantarctic zone. So no extremes, not particularly hot, not particularly cold. But it is particularly windy. Now this is the average over the whole year. Imagine averaging 16 knots, that's nautical miles per hour, or about uh, a little over 20 kilometers an hour. That's just on average, lots of gusting, etc. And the islands are not particularly damp, although um, when you're camped out doing research on animals getting rained on sideways, it does feel pretty damp. But the total volume of precipitation isn't that great. 22 inches on average a year. The eastern part of the islands tend to be a little bit wetter than the western part. Now I mentioned that the Falklands do not have native trees, but they do have two species of native shrub that are woody, woody shrubs. And this is one of them called boxwood locally. It's also found around the islands of, of Cape Horn. You find it in New Zealand and Tasmania. And this is a particularly tall specimen of it. And you can see that this shrub has gotten higher than a man's height. But this is not the tallest of the plants that are native to the island. That is, in fact, grass, the tussock grass. And tussock grass is crucial to the wildlife habitat in the Falklands, very important for many of the native animals, as we'll see in a moment. And it grows in these clumps. And when I say it grows, it grows very tall. Uh, this gentleman is standing up, and he's six foot two, or <laughs> 1.9 meters in height. So it's a dense cover in places where the tussock grass has not been burned or grazed by introduced livestock. And it can make for challenging walking if you're trying to move across this. Now the tussock has a couple of different aspects to it that make for wonderful habitat. On the top of this pedestal, you have the growing live new shoots and blades of grass, all that bright green you see. And living in there, you will find lots of small birds will build their nests down in the base. There will be spiders crawling around in there, beetles and weevils. And then at the base, you see all that light brown stuff. Those are dead leaves from the grass, dead blades of grass. But they have died and kind of fallen over. And they make a skirt around the base pedestal. And underneath that, you will often find Magellanic penguins will dig in and have, a, have their little burrow and nest there. So it's a valuable, a valuable habitat even when it's dead. And of course, at certain times of the year, the grass goes to seed, and it forms not just great nesting habitat, but it's also a good feeding place for finches, like this black chin siskin. There are a number of different vegetation communities in the islands, and I'm not going to go into all of them, but I will point out two very clear ones that, that show a distinction in this photo. And they're, you can spot them just by the different shades of green. The brighter green down closer to the coastline is tussock grass, that tall stuff that's my height when it hasn't been grazed or burned. That grass is pretty salt tolerant, so it tends to dominate close to the shoreline. Salt spray and everything blowing around doesn't really affect it. But inland from that, you have a low sort of heath-like vegetation, very much like a tundra, very easy to walk on. That's the darker green. And close up here, you see a little bit of tussock starting to come in. But most of this is a carpet of what's called diddle D. And diddle D is this heath-like vegetation. In the late summer, it buries like this. This 
berry is edible, but I believe it was created in cahoots with big sugar because you really need a lot of sugar with this if you're making jam out of diddle dee, for example. But the locals love it. Things like the kelp goose, they'll come right along and nibble that. But this is a bird that normally gets all of its food in the intertidal zone, eating seaweed. But come March, when the diddle dee berries are ripe, they'll come all the way inland and graze on them. Mm. And of course, there are penguins. I hope you're not sick of penguins yet. <laughs> and many of you will hoping, be, I'm sure, hoping to see some more penguins. If everything goes to plan tomorrow. There are Gen 2 penguins found around the island. There are king penguins in a number of different places within the Falklands. There are rockhopper penguins, which are also found on some of the uh, wilder, wilder coastlines. And of course, the Magellanic penguin that we are familiar with from southern South America. Many of you saw these in Puerto Madryn or out from Ushuaia, or just from the ship in the Beagle Channel. I know some people got uh, fortunate sightings there. The Magellanic penguin is the one that nests underground in burrows. So it's uh, a little different from the other species that are nesting right on top. The Falklands is home to the largest populations of black-browed albatross. We've been seeing these birds following the ship most days, and they are, you know, they've got this white head, a little bit of dark tinge around the eye. And they're nesting on some of the wilder cliffs, particularly in the western side of the archipelago. This fits them because, as you may recall, way back when we talked about seabirds, they have this long, thin wing shape, which is great for flying long distances at speed, but it's not very great for maneuvering. And so having a cliff top nest means when you're ready to go fishing, you just kind of have to walk to the edge, jump off and open your wings, and, and you're flying. But these are on the western side. The Falklands are also home to three species of, of native geese. Uh, this is the upland goose, so-called because it is feeding inland or upland from the beach. It's one of the few birds in the Falklands that is hunted, not in any huge numbers, but this one, this is one bird that is, it is permitted to, to take for food. That's the male or gander in front of the white one. A female standing behind. Another goose, the kelp goose, and the male is the white one here. Both of these species are also found in southern South America. As you find with many of the birds that are in the Falklands, they are part of the South American avifauna, or bird life. Hmm. And one of my favorite animals in the Falklands, this is the Falkland Island flightless steamer duck. And they're often seen right in Stanley, so very easy to see as you're just walking down the main street. And the steamer duck gets its name because as it runs along the surface of the water, flapping its wings, it looks like a side wheel paddle steamer. And the key part of their name is flightless steamer duck, because this bird is too heavy to fly. But if they're in a hurry, they do flap their wings, running along the surface of the water, getting their body out of the water a little bit, and scoot across, but they, they just never take flight. And this is one of three species of birds that are considered to be truly endemic to the Falklands, that is, not found anywhere else. In the same sense that, say, lemurs are endemic to Madagascar, or kiwi is endemic to New Zealand. The flightless steamer duck, the Falklands flightless steamer duck, found just in this archipelago. And one of the reasons, of course, that it's not getting airborne is the size of the wings. They're just too small for this very heavy, chunky bird. They, they, they look like little tanks that are trying to swim. And we'll see if we can get this video going here. You can see some steamer ducks steaming. So they're in a hurry. They're coming in to spend the night on, on the beach where I'm working. And look at this group. They're flapping, they're running, but they're getting their body out of the water, you know, so there's less drag 
And they can do that for short bursts of time and really get moving. Yeah, you wouldn't want to get trampled by that, would you? Those are Falklands flightless steamer ducks. Ooh. There are gulls to be found, and these will be very apparent just in Stanley Harbor, the dolphin gull that some of you would have paid attention to and spotted in Ushuaia, also found in southern South America. Oyster catchers are also found in both sides of the Atlantic there. Uh, this one is called the Magellanic oyster catcher. If you haven't yet twigged to this, basically if you're trying to figure out the name of what a bird is down here, a good guess is, is that it's a Magellanic something or other, named after Ferdinand Magellan, of course. And there's a Magellanic oyster catcher in this photo too, but nobody seems to notice it. Because everybody's looking at that big flamingo. I took this photo in the Falklands of a bird that got blown downwind from South America and ended up in the Falkland Islands. And this is a wonderful reminder of the proximity to the mainland and also how the wind is always blowing from the west. And it's not, it's not uncommon for some birds to, that are from the mainland to end up in the Falklands. And in fact, those are the birds that are lucky because there might have been other, other flamingos here that got blown downwind and missed the one island group and landed in the ocean and perished. Now this particular bird stayed around on this island for several weeks before disappearing. We don't know if it, were, it was able to fly back to southern Chile where there are native populations in the deep south. It's the, the flamingo is not a strictly tropical bird. So it is coming just from southern Chile. Whether it got back, we don't know. Now, many of you have come from countries that has the black-crowned night heron native in it. If you're from Canada, the United States, Mexico, or any of the South American countries, you have the black-crowned night heron living in your country somewhere. It's a very short heron. In the Falkland Islands, they call them a quark because of the, the sound that the birds make. There are turkey vultures as well, and this is the same species found in South America and North America. It's an interesting bird in that when the earliest humans visited the islands and to settle in the uh, late 1700s, they did not find turkey vultures there. It was only after cattle had been introduced and a nascent farming community had sprung up that you then had dead cattle lying around that could provide food for turkey vultures. So it's probable that these birds were being blown downwind just like that flamingo and others. But they weren't establishing on the islands because there wasn't enough food for them. But with the introduction of cattle, there was. And so the population of turkey vultures has kind of brought itself in by the wind and established itself in the past century or so. And this is one of the smartest birds in the world that a lot of folks haven't heard of, the striated caracara. It's a type of falcon, a very clever bird of prey, and it's found in a few spots in southern Chile and Argentine islands and out on the Falklands. It is very inquisitive, very unafraid of people. It's a great problem solver. Some of you might have seen there was actually an article in the New York Times about a month ago talking about the problem solving ability of this bird in, in test cases. Here's one that is trying to get at some penguin eggs. They actually are very good on their feet. They'll <laughs> run in instead of fly in, reach out with the talons, but no dice this time. The penguin bites back. This is a gosling, though, one of those geese chicks caught by the striated caracara. Now, here is a bird that is by no means timid, because uh, that's not an empty boot. That's my boot. I'm wearing it at the time. <laughs> and that is a tussock bird, which is one of the other species found only in the Falkland Islands. Tussock birds, very inquisitive, 
not at all afraid of people. In fact, they tend to walk around you when you're walking because your footfall might be disturbing some of the ground and kicking up something edible. These guys are so unafraid of people that at the little research hut that I have in uh, one of the outer islands, we've had to keep the doors closed whenever we're moving in and out because if you leave the door open, they're going to come in and check everything out. <laughs> the Cobb's Wren, and this is the last of the three species found only in the Falkland Islands. Oh. The most colorful bird in the, in the Falklands, native to the Falklands, and I'll tell you its English common name in a moment, but I want you to think about if you had been tasked with coming up with a common name for this species, would you have called it the long-tailed meadowlark? Because that's its formal name. Yeah, not a very long tail. It is a meadowlark, we'll give them that. Um, beautiful bird also found in southern South America. And you'll notice I've been talking a lot about birds. That's because the bird life in the islands is the dominant form found at least above ground in the, in the vertebrates. But there are some mammals, like the South American sea lion. That's a male in the back left, the dark animal, the big one there. All the other sea lions in this photo are females. Mm -hmm. Same species that we saw sleeping on the stairs in Puerto Madryn on the pier. There are other mammals like the Commerson's dolphin, very small dolphin, probably only just over you know, a meter and a half in length. Distinctive shape to the fin. Look at that, it's got a Mickey Mouse ear for a dorsal fin. This is uh, found quite, in, quite close in, in the Falklands, very in inshore coastal waters. Something to look for if you're out on deck as the ship tries to approach the islands tomorrow. There's also a larger species commonly found, the Peel's dolphin. And look at the shape of the fin there. It's got a normal, kind of a typical hook shape to the dorsal fin. There are whales in the inshore waters around the Falklands, and um, it's a chance that if you're keeping your eyes peeled, you might see the say whale spelled S-E-I, say whale. It's a baleen whale, a little bit smaller than the fin whales that we saw yesterday. Now, all of those are marine mammals. What about the mammals on land? Well, this is it for native terrestrial mammals. And you'll note it's standing on a piece of wood, which means it's dead, and it's probably extinct. And that's exactly right. This is the wara or Falklands fox. And when humans settled for the first time in the late 1700s, this was the only mammal they found on land. There were no mice, no rats, no other little uh, four-legged animals running around. There were birds and this fox. And as a biogeographer, it's pretty interesting conundrum because normally islands don't have many mammals on them unless those mammals were transported by people, were small enough and bred fast enough to say survive coming across on a, a bunch of broken down logs or something, or they were birds that flew there, right? So it's very hard to, to get to a remote island as a, as a predator, and yet that's the only one that was found here. And the theories have changed over the years. The most recent explanation for it based on some molecular work that shows that this animal is most closely related to a currently living Patagonian gray fox in uh, the northern, northern Chubut area. And it's been surmised that it's possible the foxes walked out to the Falklands. The Falklands were never connected to South America. The sea, when, but when sea level was much lower during the, the Pleistocene era, the last ice age, the strait of water between dry land was much narrower, and there would have been some times when there was ice, sea ice, across that narrow gap. So it's possible that's how these foxes got here. In any event, they are no more. They were hunted to extinction in the late 1700s, eight, sorry, 1870s. The 1870s, because they were very inquisitive, not afraid of people, and not at all 
afraid of walking up to lambs and eating them. Hmm. So there was a bounty on them back in the 1800s. Cattle really changed the Falklands. They were first brought in by the French when they settled in the 1760s. And the, the uh, grazing of cattle has continued to this day. But they're not the dominant farm animal, and that is sheep. And the export of wool has been the mainstay of the economy for quite some time until recent years. And both of these grazing animals have had a huge impact on the tussock grass and its distribution. In this photo, you can see a fence. On the left is where sheep are allowed to graze. On the right, they are excluded. And you can see the tussock grass is doing much better on the right side. Hmm. Now, some other animals were deliberately brought in in the 1900s, in the 20th century, to try to create some industry. This is a different kind of uh, gray fox from southern Chile. And this was brought in and introduced to some of the outer islands to create a population that could be trapped for fur to make a fur trade. It never really took off, and these animals are now left on some of the islands, particularly in the western part of the Falklands, where they are just wreaking havoc on the native bird life. Because remember, everything's nesting on the ground or in the tussock grass, so all pretty accessible to a predator like a fox. How about that as an introduced animal, the wanako? Somebody thought, hey, we could bring these over. We could, we could farm them for the fiber, the really fine wool on them that you can, you can uh, spin and use as yarn. Uh, and we could, you know, we could have them as a meat animal as well. Well, it didn't work very well. They were put onto one island in the southwest of the Falklands where they flourished for a short while. No predators. They don't even have any local uh, parasites or diseases. But they ran out of food pretty quickly. They grazed the island down to bare soil, caused massive erosion problems. And then the population starved to death, or, you know, or many of them did. So they have been uh, an ecological disaster introduced onto an island in the southwest. They, there was never any commercial gain that came from it. But of all of these introduced animals, this one has had the biggest impact, the rat. <laughs> Rats are, well, they're fantastic travelers for one thing. They don't need a lot of space. They can just stow away in a box. You give them a whole wooden ship to work with and it's just like heaven. They'll have an entire settlement of their own and civilization running in between the decks. And so it was, as human sailors moved around the world, they brought this animal with them. And in many parts of the world, the rats left the ship and established populations on shore in places where their presence is, is catastrophic for native wildlife because these are plants and animals not used to having a, a voracious ground-dwelling, uh, very active predator. And so in the Falklands, for example, islands that have rats on them do not have those endemic songbirds like the tussock bird and the cobs wren. They get eaten to oblivion. So rats have had a huge impact everywhere they've gone. And in fact, they've established themselves on every continent except Antarctica. Uh, they've been there. They've been in some of those early expedition ships. But they, of course, it's a little too cold for them to, uh, to get established on shore and survive. Now, there are some other mammals in the island. And I'd like to say a little bit about what life is like in the Falklands today. This is in downtown Stanley, a few scouts who are going out for a weekend camping trip. I don't know if all five of the mammals pictured here came back from that camping trip, but I think it's probably likely. Now, if, if you're living in Falkland Islands today, you live in one of two places. You could live in town, which is Stanley, the capital city, and the only, the only town. Or you can live in camp. Hmm. Camp, from the Spanish word campos, for countryside, means you're living out on a farm somewhere outside of town. So you've got town or you've got camp. And it, 
most everybody lives in town. Three quarters of the population is based in Stanley itself. And like many urban areas around the world, it is growing. It's drawing people away from the rural areas into the, the bright lights. The demographics from the most recent uh, census, the blue area there, those uh, almost 50% are identified as Falkland Islanders. The orange wedge, uh, British. So that Falkland Islanders and British are about 75% of the population, but then mm. you get St. Helenians in the yellow wedge. If you're not familiar with St. Helena, it's an island group in the South Atlantic off the coast of Angola by a few thousand mm -hmm. miles. Um, and there are also a growing number of Chileans and a small number of Zimbabweans living in the islands as well who have immigrated. The small number of Zimbabweans living in the islands, yes, they've come from, they were working originally as part of a demining crew and have settled. And here's town from the air, um, kind of festive looking because of all the bright colors that you see from those, uh, those roofs. Uh, it doesn't show in this photo, but it, there is a bit of a steep hill. If you leave the waterfront and go up some of the back streets, it's a bit of a steep hill to walk up. The main road. And while this photo is a little bit old, um, the only thing that's really changed is that the Land Rovers are slightly newer now. But Land Rovers are the dominant um, vehicle, and four-wheel drives uh, beyond that if it's not actually Land Rover brand. Because once you get outside of Stanley or some of the gravel roads, you are truly driving across country. And I know some of you are on excursions that may be doing just that. And like so many urban areas, there's a housing crunch. And so there are new subdivisions happening. Here's one that's coming, being built on the east side of Stanley. And there's also now a retirement home being built, aged care, assisted living uh, being built in Stanley. And what has to be one of the most frightening jobs in the world is operating that crane on a Falklands windy day. I've never seen a crane like this until this project got started. I mean, in the Falklands, that is. Until the 1980s and into the 1990s, most of the households were using peat to heat their homes and to cook. And peat is basically highly organic soil that is, you know, halfway to becoming coal if you give it another few million years. Peat is something that you can cut from communal banks at the back of town. There's no cost to harvest this except for your own labor. In fact, uh, one of the national holidays for the Falklands is peat cutting day. That was back in October. And, but very few people are still cutting peat. It is messy. It's, it's hard labor. It, it often, as it dries, you get lots of powder and dust, and it just kind of makes a mess next to the hearth where you keep some of these bricks. And most people today are now heating their homes with, uh, with diesel oil. Hmm. Particularly the older generations are continuing to garden, though, taking advantage of the long day length in the summer and use part of their yard as a veggie garden. Some of them even put in these polytunnels, little, you know, plastic uh, greenhouses. The economy of the islands is now not so much about selling wool from sheep, it's largely about tourism and fishery. And we see expedition style ships visiting and then ships like ours that will come into Stanley. And if all the ships that are scheduled to come into Stanley this year make it, it will be a bumper year with over 70,000 visitors. But it's where fishing licenses are sold that the real serious money and revenue to the Falkland Islands government comes from. Most of the licenses are sold to foreign vessels who are paying for the privilege of taking fish out of the exclusive economic zone around the islands. Squid is the main product. Ilex and Lolico squid are harvested. And it has changed the economy dramatically. Look at the, the gross domestic product 
1980 was five million pounds, and currently it's about 20 times that, based largely on the fisheries and the vices and the sales. In the future, there could be another boom happening because oil has been discovered offshore, none onshore, but in some of the areas of, to the north of the islands in particular, there have been some wells put in and oil found, but nothing is being extracted. So far, there is no extraction of oil, but if oil prices around the world were to increase sufficiently, we could see some hydrocarbon extraction in the, in the Falklands. But even without the potential for oil, you've got a really strong economy at the moment, but based very much on one main player, fisheries, and you've got a small population that it's supporting. About 3,600 people in the whole country. So the per capita income is, is very high. But one of the things that comes with having a small population is that your infrastructure costs are spread between very few people and therefore cost a lot. And so I want to show you one example of that for something that I think is dear to everybody's heart on the ship, and that is internet. And I know all the reasons why it's dear to everybody's heart, because it seems like forever since you've seen internet or experienced it. But let's step, up, step back from that for a moment and just think about it. For those of you who are paying the bills for internet at home, uh, think about what you're paying per month and what you're getting. It's probably unlimited amount of data. You don't have a cap for how much you know, you're streaming and things like that. You're paying a, a set figure a month. And whatever that figure is, I guarantee you, it is nowhere close to what the people in the Falkland Islands are paying. Ooh. Now, here's the cheapest package at the top. For 18 US dollars, 15 pounds, you can get six gigabytes, 6.6 .6 gigabytes of data usage. Hmm. Now, that's not gonna get you through more than about two movies on Netflix over the course of a month. And that's as if you're not doing anything else with it. Uh, we, as a Western society in particular, have become very reliant on unlimited data. <laughs> but that's very expensive in places where it's all going through a satellite connection. We can experience that here from a ship and using the satellite, and they can too on land. And if you look at the big package for the really big spenders down at the bottom here, for $578, you can get 364 gigabytes of use for one month. It's just that expensive when you've got such a small population base. They say the Falklands has the second most expensive internet anywhere in the world, hmm. and only behind the island of St. Helena. There's a local newspaper, the Penguin News. It comes out every week. Printed newspaper, it's also online. I've got a subscription. I try to stay on top of things that are happening there. And one of the things I enjoy about it so much is a local newspaper always gives you a great feel for a local community, because they're covering what's important to the people in that community. And so, for example, here's a headline from last year. Steve takes FIC golf competition. Now, that's great. We all love to see who is the winner of the golf competition. But what's so cool about this is they didn't give you his full name, which, if you read the small text, it's Steve Vincent. But we don't need that, because we all know it's Steve, the guy who's good at golf. <laughs> He's the Steve that won. There's plenty of other Steves. <laughs> or how about this one? Garden ornament cold case finally solved. <laughs> it's actually a very close friend of mine who keeps garden gnomes in, in her garden. And uh, she's sometimes plagued by drunken idiots coming home from the pub and thinking, oh, that would be a great joke. I'm going to steal that gnome. And they do this occasionally, and clearly it caused a lot of upset. People were looking for the culprit for quite some time. But as you can see, finally solved. <laughs> Other infrastructure things in the islands. The East Falkland and West Falkland, the two main islands, are joined now by a ferry. This vessel you see here, you can drive your Land Rover on, take an hour and a half ride across Falkland Sound, and drive it off on the other side. 
And this has really made the West Falkland so much more connected to town. The fact that they've got this service available several times a week uh, has really made their lives very different. It also services some of the outer islands on appointments. Hmm. Or you can go around the islands in the local Falk Falkland Islands government air service planes. They seat nine, and you can see here's one landed on a typical airstrip. <coughs> it's a grass runway. And the way this operation is done is fantastic because if you say it's Monday morning, you're in Stanley, and you want to go to Pebble Island tomorrow, what you do is you send an email or you phone the FIGAS, the, the air service office, on Monday morning. You got to get in before 12, and you tell them, yeah as one of me and I want to go to Pebble Island tomorrow and they say great we'll get back to you when we know when it's happening and they take all the requests that come in on Monday morning and then they put together the most efficient flight schedule to accommodate all of those and then Monday night they'll send an email out with what flights you're on but they'll also broadcast it on their local radio so you just have to tune in at 615 and you'll hear your name called and that you're on flight three and you need to report at such and such a time. And of course you hear everyone else's name too, so this is how you know that so-and-so is going out to Pebble Island and, oh, I wonder what they're doing out there. <laughs> but it works very efficiently. <laughs> if you're in the town, oh. in Stanley, you do have an electric grid. And most of the power is generated by burning Please. diesel with major generators in town, puts it out, just plug into the wall like you would normally would for many of us. But they're increasingly bringing wind power online. And so now it's up to about 30% of the power used in Stanley is generated by these wind turbines that are just outside of town. But if you don't live in Stanley, then all of your power is of your own making. Everyone outside of Stanley is not on the grid. They are off the grid. They are creating their own, whether it's from solar or wind or they've got a diesel generator. And most of them have moved to, to wind because in the diesel generator days, they usually would only run it for a few hours at night. And in the daytime, you just didn't have electricity. But now with wind turbines, some of the remote farms will have 24-hour electricity. So. I'm going to stop there, but I want to I, I want to share with you what I hope is a sense of amazement at these islands tucked down in the South Atlantic, full of amazing wildlife, hardy people who are living here, but taking advantage of these strong winds, the cold, productive waters that surround them. We'll keep our fingers crossed for tomorrow. That is very much in the, the weather god's hand. I will say the forecast is looking okay, so let's keep hoping that the wind stays calm and that we get a chance to explore a bit around these amazing sub-Antarctic islands. Thanks for your attention. I'm going to go to Gatsby's in about five minutes. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to see you there at Gatsby's in five. Thank you very much. Thank you.